So hello again. Tonight, we're going to talk about wavelength selectable photon emission. Or if you had a way with a computer where you could say what energy level you wanted in the photons you were producing, and you could digitally tell that, that's that's what we're talking about here is. Think of it like if you had a flashlight where you could dial the specific color you want, and we'll get into why mixing red, green, blue, and white LEDs is not the solution to that. So we'll get into that. So I'm often tasked with making things that help me do other things. Like if I'm going to produce a new kind of battery, then I need tools that will allow me to measure the uh, voltage and current amperage, not under load and under load. So, you know, when I say I'm going to do the following, oh, now I've got to go create the tools that confirm that I actually did what I thought I was going to do. I use, you know, Raspberry Pi computers to do that kind of thing. And I usually write software in, in Python scripting because it's just easier. I came across, and if you remember looking back to a prior presentation where we talked about how do you measure the particular wavelength of some light source? How do, how do you measure the energy level of the photons coming in? Well, I can figure out how to do that. I, I don't have the technology for the integrated circuit fabrication, but I know what needs to be done. But I need to prove it. So I need a way to basically dial the wavelength of light so that when it does impact the MEMS sensor, once I can get my hands on one, that number going in equals number coming out. So I know it's actually working on both sides. So I needed a way to say, I need to produce a particular energy level of photons in a certain quantity or flux. So I needed to create a tool. How do I do that? Well, um, I, I actually have a lot of uh, RGB lighting where I can adjust individual red, green, blue, and white um, LEDs to make colors. But that's, that's sort of, you know, from a human visual perspective, a uh, pleasant color of light, that works fine. But scientifically, it doesn't. So the level of technical detail that I go through when I get down one of these rabbit holes and creating these things that measure other things is rather deep. And sometimes I get to a cliff edge and I just can't take it any farther. Like, I don't own a semiconductor fabrication facility or don't have the funds to cover the cost of one. So it just kind of stops. I've gotten to this point. Okay. Well, you can ask this about anything that I come up with as a concept. Have I ever built and verified one of these things? So you can take me to task and say, oh, you, you, you're just preaching a concept. Well, usually I'll say concept or postulated or postulation, which means I haven't seen any evidence of anybody producing products that does this but I do see the physics, I do see the math and science that allows it to do it. So if I have the ability to do it, I can do it. If I don't have the ability, technology, funding to do it, then I'll tell you I don't like I did last week. Um, but in this particular case, I, I am pulling down the parts to be able to try and do this. I want to be able to use a computer to control the wavelength, frequency, color, and the flux the number of photons, the brightness, so I can literally dial up whatever energy I want out of a beam of photons. Have I done it yet? No. Have I seen anybody else doing it? Not dial a photon, but uh, for a specific wavelength, yes. So I want to create a wavelength selectable photon emitter. This is, if you, if you think in um, radio frequency terms or in audio terms, this would be similar to a frequency generator, but for photons. But I, I wouldn't be using a laser, so it doesn't need to be all that bright, but it's going to be bright because, you know, I don't, I don't get the dim LEDs. I get the bright LEDs. Um, <clears throat> I want to be able to digitally select the wavelength, frequency, color. I want to be able to digitally select the radiant luminosity, also known as the flux. I want to be able to do this over a wide range from, like, infrared through ultraviolet, but I also know that some of these wavelengths aren't visible to the human eye. And I also know that if I produce a flux of just any amount I want, there's some of those things that will not look brighter, but will actually be brighter because they're higher flux of higher energy photons, just not in the right wavelength to be perceived by the human eye. So there are lumens and there are ANSI lumens. The ANSI standard for luminosity is biased by 
center line of 555 nanometers, which is that bright green that the human eye is so perceptive to. So if I, if I show something that is purple, and actually the total energy output given the flux is much higher than it would have been had it been green, the human eye is not going to see it as being god awful bright, even though it is, because we're just not as perceptible in our retina of purple as we are as green. So brightness is a to behold it kind of thing. So I'm going to be talking about something where it's a do-it-yourself. I'm putting together parts to see if this is actually doable. It's not a prototype. It's not a production device. You can't go buy one on Amazon. So there will be issues that come up that have to be conquered. So detecting versus emitting. Last week, we talked about a, a MEMS sensor that could digitally identify a wavelength. And I don't quite have that, but we do have uh, gratings and prisms and things like that. And you can put color cameras behind them and see that the color is changing. So if I can change the wavelength, I can change the color and I can detect that. It'd be nice if I had a MEMS sensor for photon wavelength, but I don't. So I'll use what I've got, which is a grading and a color camera. So I want to be able to produce a full continuous spectrum of wavelength, but I know that that's not possible if I were to use the photoelectric effect and were to use a photon to excite an electron to make it move to a different shell layer and then coming back down discharging the energy and producing a photon if i do that there'll be gaps there'll be certain energy levels integral energy levels that will produce photons and some that kind of there's a gap before you get to the next level where that will produce a photon so um to quote George C. Scott from a movie, we must not have a uh, wavelength gap as opposed to a mine shaft gap. You had to be there. Um, so I want to be able to generate full bandwidth, you know, full range of photons without any gaps. So how would I do that? So the traditional solution, as I mentioned, would be to mix up colors, to have colors like red, green, blue, and a little white. Now, how you get white from just one LED, that's a different story unto itself. But it has to, it has to do with something called the, the gap in the uh, semiconductor and the uh, NPN or PNP junction. That's a whole different topic. But suffice it to say, you can go on Amazon and buy yourself an LED device that has red, green, blue, and white LEDs in it. And then you could send it a digital value and it will mix the colors and the brightness for you and produce the colors that you want. But it's not exactly that. It's, you know, if you ignore the gaps, it's a mix of close enough. Or as the saying goes, except for the people that have uh, four sensors in their retinas, you've never seen the color yellow. You've seen a mixture of red and uh, green that your brain has been taught to believe is something that we name yellow. But unless you have tetrachromacy of your retina, you don't have the red, green, blue, and yellow sensors. Therefore, you've never actually seen yellow. You've seen a mixture that we've come to believe is, is yellow. And if you, if you want to go down that rabbit hole, there's a whole topic on does blue exist or is blue just a variation of purple? Well, until they actually needed a dye that people liked and could easily reproduce and give it a name blue, we didn't really have a term for what we call blue. So blue is just a, a darker shade of purple. But now, officially, it's blue. Same thing for yellow. So, well, we can be convinced that there are colors that exist that don't actually exist. They're just agreed emissions, like brown. You ever think about the color brown? There's no actual color brown. It's just something we agree upon to have shades. It's actually a shade of red-orange, but different topic. So we want something continuous. So the way we generally, generally generate photons is we, we'll take an atom and we'll energize its electrons, um, not to the point where they're ionized off of the atom, but just to the point where they're tickled. They're excited and they go up a level or two and then they feel like that's too much energy. I'm crowding the neighborhood. 
let me spit out a photon of a particular wavelength based upon the amount of energy going up and down, and then I'll go back down to a closer to a rest state. That's generally how we generate colors, which says if I want to produce a color, a wavelength, or a frequency that is between two points, I can't really do that. What I can do is pick a different chemistry in my semiconductor to allow it to generate closer to the color that I want. There won't be a gap that's too wide or a gap in the right place. So we can tweak the chemistry, but once we tweak the chemistry, that new chemistry of that semiconductor is only good for producing specific wavelengths. It can't produce just arbitrarily any wavelength. So imagine an electron that's not associated with an atom. It's roaming free. It's been ionized away from an atom, but not so much that it's you know like up in the X-ray or gamma levels. It's it's a moderately energetic electron that's been ionized. You know, it was out on the edge of an atom, a valence electron, and it just got kicked just enough to dislodge it, and now it's roaming free. It turns out that electrons' velocity, their their direction, their speed, can be adjusted with magnetic fields because an electron is negatively charged, and you can produce a magnetic field that has the opposite polarity and bend the path of the electron. Typically, the way you, you do that is you take the magnetic coil or deflectors, and you would steer the electrons onto a glass plate that had a particular phosphor on it, and it would excite the phosphor. So you'd be taking an electron and reversing the um, photoelectric effect. So you'd now send an electron into the phosphor, which would produce a white photon or a green photon. So we're, we're used to doing that. But what if you took away the phosphor and said, what if I just took the magnetic field and I rapidly flip the polarity and uh, slowed down the electron? What would the electron need to do? Well, the electron would not have as much energy as it used to have. It would be way slowed down. And turns out if you're going to obey the conservation of energy law of physics, that means this electron has to get rid of the excess energy, has to take its kinetic, kinetic, kinetic energy and spit it out as a photon. So if I have an electron zooming along at a particular energy level and I take a magnetic field and I smack the electron and I slow it down to decelerate it, I can now make that electron spit out a photon. This, this is a known thing. This is something that occurs. It's called bremsstrahlung breaking cyclotron radiation. This is how an X-ray tube works. In an X-ray tube, you have an evacuated tube. You have two plates, an anode and a cathode, and the electrical current goes in, excites one of the plates, which causes it to spit out electrons, and they want to go over to the other plate, and you put a magnetic field in between the two, and you steer the electrons so they smack into a particular material in the other plate. Turns out the electrons, negatively charged, can be interfered with by the protons, positively charged, in the other plate material. So you can take a stream of electrons, smack them into a X-ray tube tungsten plate, and it will spit out X-rays because the electrons that would like to go past that other plate are actually being bent or uh, absorbed and then re-emitted, re and they'll produce two, two, particular, uh, two particular energy levels of X-rays. So that's how cathode ray tubes produce X-rays in X-ray sources. The principle here is, if I have an electron with a certain energy level, and I introduce a magnetic field with a very quick high pulse, I can dramatically decelerate that electron. When I decelerate it, it's going to produce a photon. If I have control over the amount of energy I put into the electron, and I have control over the direction of the electron, I'm steering it that way, and I'm going to steer it into a second electromagnet, and I have control over the second electromagnet and can like put the brakes on. I can dictate how much energy comes out of that electron as a photon. So I can literally, by adjusting the energy going in and the braking force applied against it, 
I can dictate what wavelength photon, what energy photon will be generated by the Bremsstrahlung radiation. So that in, in a nutshell is, is you know, what we're going to be looking at is, can I, under computer control, adjust Bremsstrahlung radiation to produce whatever color I want? And um, if, if I'm, you know, misspoken on Bremsstrahlung radiation, and I put this out as a YouTube video, and somebody who knows a thing or two better than I know a thing or two, and they know a better term, some other term for, okay, if you want to adjust the electron by a, a proton, then it's Bremsstrahlung. But if it's you want to adjust the velocity or direction of the electron by a magnetic field, that's not Bremsstrahlung, that's uh, Freudenhausen. Uh, I, I, I don't know. But if there's another term for it, I would be glad to use that term um, because I, I believe in science. And if, if there's already proven science out there, I'm just making use of it. So here's what happens. If I take a near ultraviolet LED, a three watt UVA LED, and I spit its photons into an uncovered piece of uh, solar cell material, photovoltaic material, that's gallium arsenide. If you take UVA photons and you spit them into gallium arsenide, it will um, ionize the gallium arsenide's electrons, their outer valence electrons. This is how you get solar panels to work, is they would very happily give up electrons on the, the valence shell on the outside. So I have my photons come in, it spits out electrons, and the electrons become free electrons. The free electrons have nowhere to go, so they're just traveling through open air. They're going to slow down very quickly if I don't accelerate them. I use one magnetic coil to accelerate the electrons, to steer them and energize them at whatever level of energy I want. So now I have my variably adjusted accelerated electrons. And then they encounter another coil that is the braking force. This is the coil that's flipped around backwards so that it's going to be slowing the electrons down head on like a head-on collision, it's going to be rapidly slowing the electrons down. And when I do that, the electrons will continue on, but they've got to give up a photon. They've got to convert some of their excess kinetic energy. Otherwise, they won't slow down. So they'll produce a photon. What wavelength the photon? Well, let's see. If I take my photon source, and then I take the particular electrons that are going to come out of the gallium arsenide, that will give me a certain energy level of photon. If I then add in the energy that I put in through the acceleration, and then I take out the energy that I smack it with to decelerate it, the resultant emission of energy should tell me what wavelength photons I'm producing. But the energy level of the resultant photons will never be any greater than the photon source plus that first acceleration, because you can't get out more than you put into it. So I will have a means of saying, I want red, green, blue, any number in between, because unlike um, photon emissions from excited electrons, magnetic coils are a continuous spectrum. There's no like gaps in a magnetic coil. There's, you put in voltage, you get a you know, magnetic field out of it, and the magnetic field can be anywhere along the way. Now, if you, if you understand quantum physics, that's not actually true, but we're not getting down to the, you know, femta amperes of current going through the magnetic field. So we don't have to look at quantum physics for this. We'll just look at photon electron emission physics. We're not going to get down even lower. So photons, electrons accelerate, direct, rapidly decelerate, produce photons, and then you have a beam trap that just sucks up the uh, electrons so that they don't cause any problem. This will not produce X-rays, not going to produce gamma rays. Since my photon source is UVA, it, it might, if I accelerate the electrons enough, it might get up to UVC energy levels, but I'm not going to get to that level. So I'll have a certain range that once I subtract out the velocity, I can do anything from UVA plus the acceleration minus however much I back it down, and that's what comes out. Lower than UVA, like, you know, blues and 
uh, purples and yellows and greens and reds, I should be able to produce those because they're all lower energy levels. So what about directing the emission? Well, won't, won't the electrons just scatter? That's the idea of the first magnet is. The first magnet not only accelerates it also as a toroid, as a coil, it will confine the, the beam. So it won't be spreading around. And the second coil is also a toroid, a donut. And uh, it will apply the breaking force, but I'm not going to bring them to a complete stop. I'm just going to extract out the photon that I want and let them go on their merry way. So I need to have a dump shield at the end, which can be something as simple as um, you know, a piece of black paper. Like I said, I'm not going to be producing harmful levels of photons. And I know what those things are. I know how you can get to there. I know what the maximum quantity of photons per second is from the LED that I'm using. So I know the maximum energy level per photon. I know the maximum number of photons. And um, if I wanted to take a safer bet, but I, I couldn't generate as energetic as uh, an output, um, instead of using UVA, I could drop it down a notch to royal blue, which is not really blue. It's kind of a purple. It's just shy of uh, UV. Now, if I do this and people look at the end result, I will have to, uh, hey, you know, these things are going to be bright. They're not lasers, but they're bright. And I'm going to be flashing this thing rather quickly when I apply the breaking force. So, you know, if you see the results of this and, you know, you've been warned, it's going to be bright and blinky. So if I wanted to create a computer that would selectively allow me to do this, I would have to define some things. So I'm going to define an envelope of emissions. So this is, if I say, I want to generate this particular wavelength, I'm going to define all the parameters I need to make it happen and call that an envelope. And then the actual um, emission, the actual spitting out of the photons, that's my emission. The band is a particular wavelength, frequency, colors, and nanometers. Luminosity, that is rel relative to the uh, radiative power or the flux, how many photons I'm spitting out. And then, um, you know, whatever emitter I'm using, in this case, the UVA LED. Um, it has specifications as to what energy actually comes out, what energy is wasted in heat, all those specifications. So, and flux I already mentioned. So you have to understand these terms to know how I'm going to define when I push a button and I want it to emit something, these are the things I'm defining so that I push the button. I don't have to every time I want a new output. I don't have to, let me dial it in. I'm going to just adjust the numbers and say, that's, uh, you know, envelope number one, hit it, and it will make the photons. Now, what controls do I have? Well, I've, I've got a known LED. I've got a known gallium arsenide uh, um, photoelectric cell. I know what the mission is from the LED. I know I can switch it off and on. I know how much voltage and the voltage range that I need to apply to it, and it needs to be as fully digitally adjustable as possible. I can go by, you know, magnetic coils, um, and I can say, well, you know, there's no really polarity of a magnetic coil. It just it produces a field in a certain direction based upon the winding, the copper winding around the, the core. And uh, if I flip that core around, now I've got a magnetic field in the other direction. So I have control over these things, but there's there's going to be losses. So you know, heat, stray photons, stray electrons. Some of it's going to be lost. Not all of it's going to be 100% efficient. Now, I need to sequence the order of these things. And But what better way to do that is, hey, I'll write some software. So I'm going to write software that's going to, let's say, I need to select the voltage that I'm going to apply to my LED to produce the flux that I want, um, the amount of power I'm going to put on the first magnetic field to accelerate the electrons. Um, how soon do I start that second magnetic coil and its reverse polarity and how much energy do I put into it? And then when do I turn it all off? Uh, because it'll have a diminishing return. So now that I have the parameters for doing it, now I need the sequencing of what do I do in what order? And then how do, you know, when do I power everything off? So that's just the verbiage of it. I want a deterministic result. Well, if I know how much I'm putting in and I know how much I'm slowing down, 
and I know the efficiency of my coils and my LEDs and such, I should be able to numerically predict the particular um, wavelength and flux that's coming out. And here's the order. So if I wanted to have a timeline from on the left, T0, that's when you know I, I first start doing things, and it goes left to right with time increasing, then the first thing I need to do is select the power level for my emitter LED. Then I need to select the power level for the acceleration magnetic field once I switch it on. Then I need to select the power for the deceleration. Then I need to select how long I'm going to be spitting out my original photons, um, the duration. Then I need to know, uh, you know, at what point I'm going to power on my various coils um, and then power on the second coil to get it to produce photons. And then when do I power this thing off to make it stop making the photons that I want? And then I power off the uh, original emitter and the magnetic coils and things like that. So literally a timeline of, if I'm writing a software, this is what the computer has to do. And you can see the orange window there is, it's not to say I'm producing the color orange, it's just that's highlighting, this is the point in the timeline where Bremsstrahlung photon emissions should occur for a duration of D2 units of time. Who says I don't do the math? <laughs> um, so I need to interface all this stuff. I need to be able to tell a computer all of these values and then have it actually implement the values. So I need to adjust voltage levels and durations and all that kind of stuff using a computer. And then I need to measure like, what's the end result of that? Well, how will I know where the photons are gonna go if it turns out they're infrared? I can't see them. But if I have a little red laser beam that points where the coil is aiming, I can know the target. I can know where the photons are going to go. And maybe I can use a non-contact therm uh, thermometer, you know, infrared camera or something to actually see the effect on the target. But I don't want to hard code everything. I want to be able to have all the algorithms and the timing in place and then drive that with parameters. And I can create an XML text file that has all the parameters in it and just say, that's the envelope I want to send right now. Go do your stuff. And so that's the idea is if I have a computer and I give it the software and the parameters of you know, its specification of all of its parts and then the sequence of running things and then the values, all the voltages and emitters and timing should be set to, I can transfer that to the little microprocessor and have it do things. So I have to have an XML file that defines all the basic specifications of the parts and that's what it would look like i know not computer people what is all that stuff it's just names of things and values of them and then i need to be able to say now that i've got my um, basic specification done and i'm defining my envelopes how, how, how do i want to define my emissions so that i can easily select those without a lot of reprogramming and so another xml I'm going to define an envelope. Remember, an envelope is, I want to generate this color, particular band of uh, colors in nanometers, and the flux, how bright do I want it? And so that would be a call up this particular envelope and spit out that color for that amount of time. Now, once I have this, I need to be able to control the voltages on LEDs. Well, I need to be able to cycle the power fast, but not you know gigahertz fast, just kilohertz fast is fine. And I need to be able to cycle the power on my magnetic coils. Now the magnetic coils are probably gonna have higher voltages driving them than my LED. My LED is like, you know, three, four volts. But the coils might have a hundred volts on them because they have to produce a lot of magnetic acceleration and braking force. So it takes different kinds of transistors to do different kinds of power levels. And I had to learn about that stuff. Who's, who's born knowing that is garbage? So I had to know interesting things about LEDs. Like you don't just stick five volts on an LED and hope for the best. An LED, you need to give constant current, constant amount of amperage. The voltage you can vary, that will change the brightness, but the current has to be of a certain level in order to get it to actually produce 
the particular light that it's supposed to produce. So I had to know that, you know, if you've got an infrared LED, they're like 1.2 volts and a specific current based upon the LED. But if you're dealing with, let's say, um, royal blue or ultraviolet like UVA, then that would be 3.6 volt. It needs more energy, more voltage to make the higher energy photons come out. So I didn't know this is part of the specification of the emitter. And just so you know, if I were to, to up this thing to, to exotic levels and do 10 watts or 50 watts, the voltage does go up, even if the wavelength doesn't go up. Just more energy, more flux. So how do I switch the LED off and on in this narrow voltage range? I use a pulse width, a pulse width modulation bucky switch. <laughs> it takes one voltage in, you adjust it, it produces another voltage out, and it's what is known as constant current. And you can see down here, you've got voltage, and you've got the LED output, and you've got a ground, and you've got this other signal that says CE, current enable. So I can actually put a little digital signal in that CE pin and wiggle it, and I can adjust the amount of energy going into the LED by how much time I give that current going to the LED. So I'm adjusting the, the brightness, the flux of it. But the color always stays the same. That's the chemistry of the semiconductor. And look, I even bought some magnetic fields coils. Turns out you can buy them 10 at a time for under 10 bucks. So I only needed two, but had to buy 10 of them to get the cheap price. And they actually specify there are 330 micro Henry's, that's the magnetic inductance, and they can take up to three amperes of current. So now I know what I need to not put in there to avoid it melting the uh, insulating coating off the copper wire. So if I give it two amps, that's fine. But what voltage? Doesn't really care so much about the voltage until I get to the inefficiencies of the copper wire. So a small enough of voltage we find. I don't need those high power transistors I was talking about. A typical MOSFET would be fine. And you know, I'll just have one coil facing this way and the other coil facing the other way. And that way I accelerate and then break. Now, if I want to produ uh, produce the higher power for the coil, I actually need two things. I went looking for a uh, DC supply that I could gate, like that LED supply where it had a signal pin that I could just flip the signal pin back and forth. I could not find one. But what I could find was my power converter. That's the thing at the top right. That would generate the voltage out. And then I had to give it a switch. Now, you want to switch the output from it, not the input to it. Because see all those little silver round things? Those are capacitors. And if you shut off the incoming voltage, they'll drain. And then when you turn it back on, they'll take time to charge back up before you get your voltage out. So what you want to use that little blue thing at the bottom to is switch the output of your power supply. So you're switching your, your full current off and on. So lots of parts and pieces, but individually they're cheap and you usually buy them in quantity. And I can use them for other projects. Now, this thing will not be battery operated because batteries have to be charged up. And I don't want to make this thing portable. I'm not taking it out into the field. So mains power is fine. But, uh, you know, two amps is enough to drive everything that I need here because it's two amps at 120 volts AC, which by the time you bring it down to low voltage, it's a lot more amps. I'm going to need a little heat sink on my three watt LED. Not a fan, just full heat sink. If I was doing uh, 10 watts, I'd probably need a, a liquid loop cool big heat sink, but I'm not so. So what kind of controls do I need from an operator perspective to say, make it do its stuff? I need to select the envelope and I need to be able to turn on and off my little red dot laser pointer. Remember me saying you buy things in quantities? A long time ago, a couple of years ago, I worked on a, a spectroscope that was a digital spectroscope I needed red dot lasers to point where the sensor for the spectroscope was pointing. So I bought like a 10 pack of red little tiny LED marker lasers. So I've got one, didn't have to spend extra money for that. So when I, when I spend money on projects, reusability is key. And I do actually have an infrared USB camera that I can point at things and determine the, uh, the infrared emissions from it. So if, I, if I'm generating infrared photons, I can see them. So I'm going to have power for my computer, 
power for a display, a computer display, power for the LED, and power for my two magnetic fields. So the main computer, the one that interfaces with the human, um, it's, it's going to be a Raspberry Pi Zero 2W. They're cheap. They're like 20 bucks. And I have those. It'll do a lot of that human interface stuff, transferring files and, you know, the Python scripts and things like that will be run on the Raspberry Pi. Now, I need to be able to switch those voltages very, very fast with simple interfaces that don't have a lot of overhead in them. So I'll use a, a little tiny microcontroller computer called a Raspberry Pi RP2040. So I've got one of those. I'll use that. And that will be what switches voltages and such. And I need to use something that digitally switches as opposed to like relays and servos and stuff because I don't want to be clacking a relay at, you know, thousands of times per second because it would likely burn out. But I can use the uh, the pulse width modulation of the RP2040 to switch the, the voltages off and on to get what I want. Now, since I am cycling them so fast, I probably want to put some aluminum foil around it because it's generating, it's going to be generating lots of uh, spurious radio traffic. I don't want the FCC on my front door. So the photons are coming out of an emitter. The emitter is, it's just an LED. It's a funky kind of LED. It's surface mounted and it produces a particular wavelength and runs on a certain voltage and I have to have a con constant current power supply. But you buy them like, you know, 10 at a time for five bucks. So I have it. So here's how you control the magnetic fields. You have the power output, the power supply, and the coil. That's one of the two. And you'll have the uh, RP2040 computer driving the, the gate that switches off and on the output of the power supply to drive the coil. And I'll have two of those. And then the human interface stuff, keyboard, mouse, display, all that kind of stuff will be on the, uh, the full size, uh, the Raspberry Pi Zero 2W, normal computer stuff. Now, since I want to aim this thing, and I might want to put it on a tripod, when I get the device built, I'll throw a one quarter uh, inch by 20 turns per inch threaded receptacle little bolt on the bottom so I can mount this thing on a tripod and adjust where it's pointing. And here's the, the primary computer. It's a, a Raspberry Pi Zero 2W. And here's the secondary computer. I zoomed it up. It's actually much smaller. It's about as, as large as the end of your thumb. It's going to do the power switching on both the coils and the LED. Oh, and if you see, it's got a USB-C connector at the top, so it'll be connected by the USB-C. So over the years, we've extrapolated um, LEDs. LEDs went from like red and green, and that's all you get. And now we've got blue and ultraviolet, and we can mix them and put multiple of them in a single device. And to get them better and more capable, we are even putting little filters on them. And we have things like uh, nano LEDs and quantum dots, and but they all suffer from this same problem of integral gaps because they're all based upon exciting electrons that then produce photons. So even with multicolor LEDs, we're not really at a scientifically measurable level getting what we expect. So we're going to take this down to the quantum scale and say, if I can get these two magnetic fields to produce the photon of my chosen color, then why don't we scale this thing down to that nano level and make a MIMS emitter that instead of being semiconductor based is two coil based. And it uses Bremster lung radiation. And so now we can produce little tiny wavelength specific emitters that are under computer control. If I have the ability to do that, why don't I put millions of those things into an array and I'll call it a video display. So now instead of a video display being stuck with however many colors I can get by mixing R, G, B, and W, I can get the full spectrum of colors. And they're smaller than an LED. So I can now have off the deep end kind of uh, scales of video walls and color. But so far, we're only talking about like I want to produce a particular color and produce a color for a certain period of time, and then I'm done. What if the color that I want to produce is not in visible light, but in, I don't know, radio waves? Imagine if I had one of these devices producing the photons of my choice, which happen to be in radio, and I have a computer that 
can control the particular wavelength and whether it's on or off, I now have the ability to say, I want to produce frequency modulation radio waves. So now I can use a computer to send a music or voice into it, and it will produce FM modulated radio waves without any of the stuff that we need today, like tubes or, or semiconductors or tuned coils or antennas, you know, even at high powers. So we would have a radio transmitter that could do whatever modulation the computer came up with, frequency, phase, any of that stuff. And it wouldn't be specific to specific wavelengths. Almost done. We're getting there. And we could extrapolate this to the very large. Imagine if I could produce the flux that I want at the wavelength that I want in something that was a very large array of emitters or a very large emitter. Hey, it cycles back around to radiation reflection pressure because now I can produce whatever photons I want at whatever energy level I want and send them into my reflector. So now instead of turning my propulsion source off and on, I can actually vary the amount of propulsive force by the color of the light, by the flux of the light. So in conclusion, um, a modified form of Bremsstrahlung radiation should allow me to select whatever photons I want to produce, and the amount of power that I put to it is the flux that I want. I can, I can throw uh, bells and whistles in there and adjust things and make it a little more fun to work with. If I wanted to do this as an official laboratory device, you know, I went and commissioned Thor Labs to build me something. It would be many thousands of dollars because it would be something people haven't produced before. But in a do-it-yourselfer environment, I'm, I'm going to create kind of an engineering model of prototype and see what happens. It goes into my list of projects. If you were reading the email from earlier today, I had a project that we were going to go look at a dark star down in the southern constellation and um, it's no longer visible this time of the year. So that project is shelved until the fall. Hey, I freed up some time. Let me go work on this. I can't have any spare time. So anyway, um, but if Bremsstrahlung radiation works as I expect, and I get any kind of photons out, and I can vary the color of the photons, even if it's in the visible light range, it proves the concept, not at the physics level, because Bremsstrahlung is a thing, but it proves it at the practical, electromechanical world. Then again, uh, reality could smack me upside the head and say, it's just a brain fart. And of course, lots of background links. And another form of breaking radiation, for those that aren't aware of it, is something called Cherenkov radiation. That's that blue glow that you get out of nuclear reactors and also from neutrinos uh, at the uh, South Pole. And for those that don't know about people that have that uh, fourth receptor in their eyeballs, in their retinas, tetrachromacy. Okay, now, know that I created all this minutia content for the people that are going to see this as a public video, and they can browse through it to their heart's content. And yes, I, I did expect some of it to like whiz past some of my normal audience and that's fine, that, that's understood. So now we get to the point of comments, questions. Uh, Moreau, can you go back to uh, how uh, the radiation goes about? Because I want to understand what is the medium that, because you have an electron going to a coil and then you're going to slow down that coil, but what I is... Said. Yeah, can you go back to the how it goes? Give me a moment. Before. There? Yeah. Okay. So you have... You have a UVA LED striking a gallium arsenide material producing oh. electrons. You have, a coil, you have a coil that accelerates the electrons. Then you have an opposing coil that you energize like a slamming reverse force at a greater energy to reduce the kinetic energy of the electrons. They're not curving away, they're literally being head-on collision countered. And in doing so, you reduce the kinetic energy of the electrons, and therefore the electrons need to emit a photon, and that's where you get the Bremsstrahlung radiation. Uh, 
I just don't understand why you like if you're putting a, a source, you're yeah. accelerating a electron using the photoelectric effect. No, magnetic field. There's one toroid for speeding up the electrons to add more yeah. energy to them, oh. and another toroid for slamming on the brakes. Okay. Yeah, but the source the source is using the photoelectric effect, yes, right? It is. Yes, photo, it is. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. okay. Yes, it is. So you've got an LED which uses the photoelectric effect. It's actually taking the P and P junction and the gap between the junction and producing a particular wavelength out, not just blue, but UVA. Yeah, so, UV, high energy, yeah. so it causes But it's not U V C. It's not sterilization, you know, harmful mm -hmm. to the skin. It's it's weak UV. Okay. At yeah, the, that's at the three watt. Line. So it's producing yeah. energetic photons. And the reason why I'm using UVA is because that produces a specific energy level output when those photons strike gallium arsenide material. So it's chemistry. I want my electrons to start off with a certain energy level. Mm. So UVA, gallium arsenide produces electrons of a specific energy level that's my starting point and they go on a copper wire that that's gonna get them to a, a copper a copper coil yes that's uh -huh. the toroids they're going to accelerate the electrons okay and would that like the resistance of the copper wire wouldn't affect that yes it will slow down the electrons it will accelerate them but also slow them down so because that will be a, a a level that cannot be accelerated more than that because of yes. the resistance and we will transform that into heat yes and that's why okay. I, that's why i had to know the characteristics of the coil of the toroid which is 330 microhenries with a maximum current of five amperes and i'm only going to be okay. putting two amperes into it so i don't expect it to heat up a lot so then it gets to the second coil and then it's decelerated by the magnetic field of the second coil yes okay so the second coil has a different source of electricity yes to produce a different magnetic yes mm -hmm. and it's okay. also flipped the other way okay. the, field, the field coil is opposing so they're not connecting this wire is passing through the other one yes they're, they're they've got their own independent digitally controlled power supplies so okay. accelerate, slam on the brakes. And then when they slam on the brakes, it will be a reverse photoelectric effect kind of to emit the electron. What kind of media will there, there, there be emitted? What kind of media? What? So the, the electron yeah. loses energy? Yes. And, it, it's, and the light comes out of the copper wire? No, the electron. The electron is the thing that has the kinetic energy. It is not. Yeah. It is not associated with the mat with an atom. It has been ionized. And then, so how you like you losing energy in that copper wire? And the copper wire, let's say, let's not think about the individual electron, but the electron is traveling in a copper wire on the coil, right? No, the electron is traveling through the magnetic field, not through the coil itself. Electrons need need a medium to travel, unless if they are like being shoot out like a, a like so, an electron. So in in a cathode ray tube. Yeah, a cathode ray tube. What is so, the medium? What is the medium that the electrons are traveling through? It's almost vacuum. It's like low go. low there gas. I have a vacuum pump. Oh, okay. I will so have to this is a that's why I'm trying to, to understand. It. What is the medium like? What vacuum? Okay, no so so you're gonna have a gas? No. Inside of like no, a, make a no, cathode if ray? I, no, because if I put a gas in there, I will get a photoelectric effect from the electrons interacting with the gas. I don't want that. But then they are traveling inside of the copper wire, right? No, just like I an X-ray just... tube, they're traveling in free space. They are not associated with an atom. They're traveling free. Okay, I need to read more about the okay okay structure. look if you want to look up you, you can either follow the link at the end or you can look at brimster lung radiation it is what is used in every x-ray tube mm. and an x-ray tube is an evacuated tube okay and the electrons 
literally are being uh, accelerated by a magnetic field and then rapidly decelerated by the protons, by the positive particles within the plate that they're being shot into. But the effect is the same. They're having their uh, kinetic energy dramatically reduced. And that's where you get the photons from. Okay, I need you to read more of it because I'm not understanding. Well, I mean, if it, if it works, it works. If it doesn't work, uh, hey, most of the parts I already had. I, yeah, I, because if, I don't have to if buy the electrons, I already have it. Yeah, if it's not evacuated mm -hmm. or the if they are evacuated, the like partial vacuum and you have a specific gas there, uh, you know, if it's like regular atmosphere and you have air, the, the electrons won't travel much. I know. That's why it needs to be evacuated. But then they need a medium to travel. No, they don't have a medium in an x-ray tube. But they do. They have like a, a partial vacuum. No, an x-ray tube is not a partial vacuum. It's not a complete vacuum. That is. Yeah? Uh-huh. Okay, I need to read up. The only time that they emit photons is when they strike the uh, uh, opposing plate, the opposing, the, not the anode, but the cathode. They strike the opposing plate, and they don't actually strike the plate. The electrons are either passing through the plate or they're getting close enough to the protons to have their velocity change. The ones that are actually absorbed by the atoms in the plate, those are kind of useless. They filter those out because they're the wrong X-ray wavelength. The ones that just get bent and don't actually get absorbed by the um, atoms in the plate material, those are the ones that actually produce the x-rays you want. I need to, to review that. Brems for long. Um, yeah, yeah, Brems. Brems Helen, um, Helen it, it's, it, it actually, when you review it, it's so easy. I just got Monroe's letter like two hours earlier and started reading it. It, 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 it really, all, all that's happening is when the electron in an x-ray tube when an electron uh, goes from the cathode to the anode, if it strikes an electron and bumps it out of its orbit and another electron pops into that orbit, of course it's going to be the characteristic uh, wavelength of tungsten, right? Mm -hmm. So it, it's not useful for what Monroe's doing. Yep. But if the electron goes near the nucleus and it it's it bends its direction from that because of the pull of the nucleus, then uh, the electron is slowing down. And that just by conservation of energy, that energy is emitted as an X-ray. Um, and what Monroe is doing, anyway, when, when you see it on, uh, when you look up the breaking radiation, it's it's uh, much easier Makes once sense. you look at it. Right. Radiation. It's, yeah. it's, it's very, very similar to Cherenkov radiation that we see with neutrinos. It's you have a particle that's moving at a certain speed, going in a certain direction, and therefore it has a certain embodied energy. If something comes along and changes that velocity, either direction or speed, if it changes it, um, the energy's got to go somewhere. So it transfers it out as photon and goes on its merry way. And all I've done is digitally control that. In an X-ray tube, it's kind of fixed. You know how much energy you're putting on the plate. You know how much energy is going in the magnetic field. You know what you're going to get out of it. You're going to get two different wavelengths. You want one of them to be basically absorbed into lead because you can't use it. And the other one is your actual X-rays you use for your X-ray imaging. And you can put roughly 25,000 volts into the plate to charge it up. It's integral. So more or less, and you don't get out the X-ray wavelength you want but precisely around 25 point something kilovolts, you'll get the x-rays that you want. Now where that, where I first encountered all this stuff is many years ago, I worked for a software company that did private practice x-ray. It's called uh, Pictures and Acquisition Communication Systems or PACS. And so I had to deal with a lot of x-ray studies. So I went, this sounds familiar. So I started reading into it and went, yeah, that's how an X-ray tube works. But it was never communicated or educated to me that that's Bremstrelung radiation. It was just, that's how an X-ray tube works. Put in a couple of, you know, put in 20,000 volts, crank up the plate, and you excite material. You produce some electrons. The electrons hit tungsten. The tungsten produces photons. The photons are X-rays. I have one more question, and that question is for Manuela. Yes? Manuela, 
How yeah. do you pronounce that? Which one? Bremsstrahlung. 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 I, I knew so you'd know how to pronounce it correctly. <laughs> By free electrons. So they are not related to a specific uh, wavelength. So they will not have bands of specific colors. Okay, got it. No, no, the, the electrons will have a certain energy applied to them through the acceleration. No, uh, no, now I kind of, because I was trying to understand <clears throat> if they were free or not. They're free. Because when you have a photoelectric effect, uh, the current is in the couple wire. Yes, but that's not this. Now, if, if you look closely at the Bremsstrahlung uh, Wikipedia article, you'll see it refers to the electrons as free-free or free-free. That means these electrons are in free space before they encounter the breaking effect. And after they encounter the breaking effect and they spit out the photon, they're still free running electrons. So that's why on an X-ray machine, you have to have a lead plate behind you because the X-rays go through you to a varying degree and they hit the film, expose the film, but any electrons that continue on are X-rays and you have to have a lead grid behind you to make sure that all the people in the adjoining office space don't get x-rayed. So the name is already telling. It's breaking radiation. Yes. The part that I didn't get was because it interacts, in this particular case, with um, protons, it's cyclotronic radiation. It's cyclotron radiation as opposed to synchrotron radiation. But that's neither here nor there. It's just I produce an electron, I accelerate the electron to a known energy level, I then decelerate the electron with a known energy opposing level, and therefore a particular photon is emitted. In the case of X-ray tubes, it's it's fixed. You know what you're going to put in, you know what you're going to get out, and you always want that because that's the particular thing you're doing is X-rays. But in this case, it's, it's dial a wavelength, and since electromagnetic fields are continuous, whereas the photoelectric effect is not, I should be able to dial up photons that you cannot get from a particular chemistry LED. There's no uh, gap. There's no band gap issue. But we'll see. Okay, I'm going to read up uh, again a little bit. Well, you're. I won't say you're my naysayer, but you're my person that has the scientific current background that can, like, I won't say poke holes in what I'm thinking about, but uh, bring along a shotgun. <laughs> All right. Yeah, but it's like you're starting nowadays talking about stuff that is above my pay grade. I need no, to no, study no. It's not above your pay grade. It's above your current pay. It's yes. Above where you can get to. I know that. I know. And and nobody's born knowing any of this stuff. And some of it is either new, like last week's um, research report, or it's repurposing. Repurposing is. <laughs> Yeah. In this. But I, I you know I grew up in an era where you could go to a hardware store and browse. You could find what you wanted. You didn't buy things in prepackaged boxes. You said exactly. I only need three of these washers. Fine, they're a nickel a piece. Yeah, exactly. I, I was, I'm in trouble. I was raised metrics. Whenever I have to get something like plumbing stuff, I have no clue oh, about it. <laughs> Well, you'll, you'll note that when I do presentations and I measure stuff, I yeah. measure stuff in both units, and I put both units there. And I don't make a big deal about it, like, you know, I'll put the metric there, and then in parentheses, put the SAE units. Like, no, it's just like metric, SAE, not even a comma between them. It's just, you know, it's Celsius and it's Fahrenheit. And then for the really scientific folks, Kelvin. Kelvin. Yeah, yeah. Hi, yeah. everyone. I, I, I am like... She's working tomorrow? No, I'm not working, but I'm used to wake up early. Oh, okay. So I'm, I'm, I'm like you're you know, fading already. Well, I... I'm no longer sharing. I am recording, but uh, I guess we can end at this point. Any comments or questions before we close? All right. Have a good night. You All too. Right. Good night, everyone. Good night. Bye. Thank you.